Good morning, and welcome to St. James Lutheran Church. I am Pastor Christian Markwart. Uh, glad to see so many of you got your snow plows out, got your shovels out, braved the cold, made it here. Um, I had everything shoveled. I think I, we had about 10 inches here in Milwaukee, and then the snow plow finally came by, and I, the last couple big snow and ice boulders I picked up with my hands because was, I was afraid the shovel was going to break otherwise, but... We made it here. Glad you're here. We are um, continuing to celebrate the season of Epiphany, and today we're celebrating the baptism of Jesus um, and recognizing what that is and what baptism means for all of us even today. That'll be the focus of our worship as we get started this morning, but we're going to start with our opening hymn. That is hymn number 379. You'll find that near the middle of the blue hymnal. The words are also displayed on the screen. May God bless our worship this morning. Amen. I don't know about you, but I've never sung that hymn before, but by the fourth verse, I felt like I was starting to get it. Maybe next time we'll be able to sing it even better. Our worship continues as we use the service setting one. You'll find that on page 154 in the front of the blue hymnal, the words are also displayed on the screen. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. us 
Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Keep us who are baptized into Christ, faithful in our calling as your children, and make us heirs with him of everlasting life. Through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 49. As we are in the season of Epiphany, as we are celebrating the gospel, going out to other nations, to other people who have not heard it before, um, these verses describe 
God's word going out not just to the surrounding nations, but even out to the islands, even places where people can't even walk, somehow the message is going to get there. And today we can say the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed all over the world, even where there are hostile governments, even where people don't want to hear it, even where there are language barriers or cultural barriers, somehow the gospel has gotten there because God has made sure that it's happened. A reading from Isaiah chapter 49, beginning at verse 1. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 6. As we are talking about the baptism of Jesus, we also naturally immediately think of our own baptisms. And that's actually part of the reason that our worship services begin the way that they do. That when we say in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we remember that at our baptisms, we were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that wasn't just a mere ceremony that changes things. God brings us into his family through that water in his word. And so in these verses, we find out that baptism isn't just something that brings us into God's family, but it's something that unites us with Jesus' death and promises us the resurrection at the same time. And so you can think, those of you who have been baptized, um, it's not just that I'm here, it's not just that somebody said some words and put some water on me, but I have been united with Jesus completely. A reading from Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God." In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Our worship continues with our gospel acclamation. If you are following along in the blue hymnal, please note that we will sing the seasonal verse for Epiphany. Please stand. Alleluia. Jesus is the light of the world. In him we have the light of life. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The gospel reading for the first Sunday after the Epiphany comes from Mark chapter 1. The reading begins at verse 4. 
And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. We continue by singing our hymn of the day. That's hymn number 377. You'll find that near the middle of the blue hymnal. The words are also displayed on the screen. Verse 8 here, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. There's um, this, I don't know if it's like a thought experiment sort of a thing, but, or, or just an illustration that people have used, but something about uh, there being an elephant. You know, there's an elephant in the room, and all these people around the elephant are all blindfolded. And if you reached out and you touched an elephant and you were blindfolded, um, you might get an idea that this is an elephant. Um, an elephant is a really big thing, it's a large creature. Went to the zoo recently, saw an elephant, was again surprised at how big they are. But if you were blindfolded and you just touched some part of the elephant, you might not know what an elephant is if you've never seen one. You might reach out and touch the elephant's big ear and say, wow, this is some strange creature, this is made of ears, I, I don't know what this thing is. You touch the trunk, wow, it's, is this like a, some kind of a snake or something? What, what is this? You touch just one of his giant, big, padded feet. Is this like some giant mammal centipede thing? You know, what is this? And 
you touch the tail. Oh, I mean, there's there's some joke about all these people touching different parts of the elephant and trying to figure out what this thing is because they've never seen it and they're blindfolded. And, and I, I bring that up because there are various sections of the Bible that are disputed for different reasons. Um, but it's possible that this is the most disputed thing in the whole Bible. And it's what in the world is going on in Mark chapter 1. What in the world is going on at Jesus' baptism? What in the world is going on with John and all of this stuff? What is this? How can we figure out what to say what this is? Because we don't like to be blindfolded trying to figure out what the elephant is. We want to just be able to see it, examine it, dissect the elephant, look at every little part, describe what it is, and know it thoroughly. We don't like uncertainty. And some of you who are black and white people really, really like to know exactly what to say, how to say it, any sort of like somewhere in between, that's no good. And in here, there's all sorts of little peculiarities and disagreement and debate, and we're going to do our best just to look at all these perspectives and land somewhere. Because we've got to figure out what is going on in these verses. And the Gospel of Mark starts out, and I know it's not even printed in your bulletin, but it starts out at the beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it starts out, and I'm just going to go through this. I know it's not printed, but um, I think this is... This is hilarious. I really enjoy this. It starts out in verse 2. It says, It is written in Isaiah the prophet, and the guy who wrote this, Mark, who probably was influenced um, a lot by Peter, because Mark, or John Mark, as he's um, referred to in Acts, he knew Peter. He stayed, um, stayed around Peter, um, I think, you know, in the same town that he lived. They knew each other, and even some of the ancient church fathers from like um, the 100 AD, 150 AD, they called this the memoirs of Peter that Mark wrote down. That's the way that they described it. And so Mark says, this is a quote. This is what Isaiah the prophet has written. And then he immediately says, it's not, the immediate quote is not from Isaiah. It's from Malachi, um, from Malachi chapter 3. It's almost like maybe there would have been brackets around it because he's, he, he does quote Isaiah, but immediately you say, well, why did you, why did you say it like that? Why did you word it like that? And it reminds me of something else um, Peter does in Acts chapter 1. And I have to say that Peter must have been speaking through the Holy Spirit, because otherwise there's no way you'd make this connection. Um, in Acts chapter 1, all the disciples are gathered around, and Judas is, you know, Jesus has risen, Judas is dead. There are only 11 disciples now. And they say, well, we need another one. And Peter quotes two passages from the book of Psalms, they are completely unconnected, at least as far as I can tell. There's no way I'd make the connections that Peter's making, and yet he makes them. He says, after all, Scripture says this, and it says this, therefore we need another disciple. And um, if you want later, go check out Acts chapter 1, or if you're watching this at home, or wherever you are, um, check out Acts chapter 1 and just see how far apart those two references Peter has and, and, it, and it makes me think of this, because he's, he's quoting Isaiah, but he says, as, it's like as he was saying it, I also want to throw in Malachi, so that I make sure I'm quoting the two people that I really want to talk about. Because um, I want to talk about John the Baptist, and he's referenced in both Malachi and Isaiah, Isaiah being the prophet who spoke the most about the Messiah, the Savior who was to come, and Malachi being the prophet who wrote last. Malachi was the last prophet who said anything and now people have been waiting for hundreds of years for anything. And who speaks, who says something? This guy, John. Well, what was John doing? John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Um, okay. Now, we're in the first verse of the verses that I want to go through, and already there's disagreement about what in the world is going on here, um, because the Jewish people had something like this already, but this is different. They had various um, things that had to take place where people would be washed in water. They had cleansing rites, um, and if you read through the Old Testament, you'll find a number of them. 
Um, I, there's a, a section where it talks about even the high priest and the other priests having to wash um, before they perform their services. So this is not entirely unfamiliar, and yet this is different. This is different from what came before. And we know that it's different because even if we look at the response of the Pharisees, they said, what, what are you doing out here? You know, what, what are you doing out here in the, in, in the wilderness? You're roughly 20 miles away from Jerusalem. He, these huge crowds are coming out to you. Why are you washing people and whose authority? Who, who told you you could do this? He said, are, are you the Messiah? Are you the prophet? Are you Elijah? Because um, what you're doing is something unique from what we've done before. And he says, no, I'm not any of them, but I was written about. I am the one calling out in the wilderness. That's what John was. And that's what he told him, because that's what he was. John was baptizing in the desert region, and he was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I did something that I don't normally do, just because it's a waste of my time. Uh, but I looked up on Wikipedia what what the wise scholars of Wikipedia, um, all the various people who, any, basically anything about the Bible, they say I don't, I, all of it's made up. Jesus, I mean, there's even debate. Some people will say Jesus wasn't even real. Some historians have argued that. It's not true. Um, there's many things we could point to. But apparently there's a couple things that even people who don't believe the Bible, don't believe the miracles, don't believe the vast majority of it, there's one or two things that they are in agreement on. And they do agree that Jesus was baptized by John. And they say this must have happened because otherwise it would not be written down. Here's what that means. If you were going to tell a story about yourself, about who you are, about what you accomplished, you'd probably tell good things. You wouldn't talk about the time that years ago you were late and you missed the bus and your parents got mad at you because they had to drive you to school. You wouldn't tell about the time that you forgot to turn in your homework and you got a detention. You wouldn't talk about the time that you dropped that pass. You wouldn't talk about the time that you dropped a glass of milk on the floor and you actually did cry about it. You wouldn't mention those things. If you were telling the story of your life, it would be a lot of good things. Here's what I accomplished. Here's what I did. Here's when things got better and better for me. And if you look at the history um, of the ancient peoples, that's what you find. And actually, if you read um, autobiographies of modern leaders and rulers and officials of people throughout the world, the version of their story that they tell makes them look great. And if you read the ancient histories of the Egyptians, look at all these pharaohs and kings. They conquered nations. They, they killed millions of people. They, all the nations around them paid tribute. They paid gold, and here's the amount of gold. And it was some exaggerated, insane number that wasn't true. Basically, the point is, if you're telling your story, you're going to emphasize the good things about you. You're going to minimize the bad things about you. And all the ancient histories of the world do that, except for what we find in the Old Testament. That is distinct and it's different. Because if you read through the Old Testament, you don't come away with the idea, here are the mighty kings and rulers, all the people that they conquered. Instead, you say, these guys were all messed up, they were failures, they were pitiful, and they fell short over and over and over again. And so some people have said, just looking at literature and the way people write, these things must be true because otherwise they wouldn't be written down. Nobody would say this. Nobody who really liked Abraham would mention his shortcomings. Nobody who really liked David or Moses would point out all the times that they failed, unless that's not really the point of the book. And so in this section, we see John is preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Makes sense that all these people would, would come to him because they had sinned, they had fallen short, but then Jesus shows up too. And people have said, well, why would he do that? Why would he show up? Why would he be washed? Um, if all these sinners are around, why would he also be there unless it actually happened? This must have happened. And so Bible scholars and 
non-believing people alike can agree, this did happen. But what's the point? And what in the world was John doing? And again, I say just about every detail of this section is um, disputed. Not that it happened, because everybody agrees this did happen. But what in the world did it mean? The Pharisees went out to John and they said, well, why are you baptizing? What's the point of this? Um, And then the question is, well, I mean, (laughs) one of the many questions is, is John's baptism different from Jesus' baptism? And I talked about that last year. And uh, people have said all sorts of different things. I could quote reputable Bible scholars. I could quote church fathers who are referenced, um, and people have quoted them for hundreds of years, even over a thousand years. I could tell you there are all these different opinions because everybody disagrees, even today. If you want to start a debate among Christians, say, what do you think about baptism? What do you think about it? it? What does it do? Does it accomplish anything? Is it something? Is it nothing? Is it somewhere in the middle? Um, boy, there's a lot of opinions out there. So let's just look at this ourselves and see if we can figure out we're not the world's smartest people. We're not all brilliant scholars. But maybe if we just look at what's written down in the Bible, we can figure it out. John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And again, I am going to reference Peter because on his big sermon on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Now, see, now you've got a reason to read read Acts 1 and Acts 2. His big sermon Day of Pentecost, people listen to what he has to say. He says, you need a savior. The people are cut to the heart. He said, the Messiah was sent, and you crucified him. And they say, well, what should we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Almost word for word, the same thing that we find in Mark chapter 1. The people repented of their sins. They certainly needed to do that. And they were baptized and... If John is proclaiming there is a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, then I think that's actually what it means. And I think when it says that in Acts chapter 2, that's also what it means. And when it says in Romans chapter 6 that if somebody is baptized, at the time that they're baptized, Jesus' death becomes their death, and his resurrection becomes their resurrection, I think that's true. And the same thing in uh, Colossians chapter 2 when it talks about not just baptism but circumcision. Oh, see, now there's another good question. What is circumcision? What in the world is it? What was the point of it? Did it accomplish anything? Did it not accomplish anything? Um, In Genesis chapter 17, see, you're, you're, you're getting your money's worth. Some people have told me sometimes, Pastor, you don't dig down deep enough into some of this stuff. Well, now you, now you get to. Um, In Genesis chapter 17, we hear about the covenant of circumcision. It was something that didn't exist before, but God talked to a guy named Abram. 99 years old, that was still his name. I know we sing the song, Father Abraham and Many Sons, but back in Genesis chapter 17, his name was still Abram. God said, Abram, I'm going to give you a new name. Your name is now Abraham. You're going to be the the father of many nations. All these people are going to be related to you, descended from you, and I'm going to give you something special. I'm going to give you something called circumcision. And some people have said circumcision is just a little mark in the skin. It didn't really mean anything. It's just a little cut. It's done in five seconds, whatever. Um, But God says that when when, he, when sons were circumcised on the eighth day in accordance with God's command, they were part of the covenant family. And if they weren't circumcised, they weren't a part of the family. And we have this really interesting thing where God commands Abraham to do this to his son, and God commanded fathers to do that to their sons after them. If you want your son to be part of God's family, this was the way to do it. And you might say, well, why didn't they wait until the sons were old enough? Maybe they could explain it to them, say, oh, well, you know, when you're old enough, maybe you can decide for yourself if you want to be circumcised. But actually, if fathers wanted their sons to be part of God's family, that was the way to do it. It was commanded. It was required. And Jesus, too, was circumcised on the eighth day in accordance with God's command. 
Circumcision did something. And in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, Paul references circumcision. And he says, God performed a circumcision on you. It didn't have anything to do with cutting. It didn't have anything to do with a a piece of skin. Um, But he changed your heart, and he immediately connects it with baptism. All these times that baptism is referenced in the New Testament, it's always mentioned as welcoming somebody into the family, God bringing somebody in, God accomplishing something, even though from our perspective, um, a pastor does it, a friend does it, somebody in the family does it, but God does it. And you can know that that's true because even right here um, in verse 8, John says, I baptize with water, but just wait because Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit And then, immediately after that, John baptizes Jesus, and the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus. And John said, I can't do that, and yet it happened. Which means that when baptism takes place, it's not just about the person doing the act, but God is at work. And so as these people came out to John in the desert, and again, this is so It's so interesting because many of the people who showed up there were Jewish. They had been circumcised, the males anyway. They had known about the promise of the Messiah. And yet John said, you need to be prepared. Your hearts need to be prepared for Jesus. And this is what has to take place. Repent, be baptized, receive forgiveness, believe. And so that's what they did. And finally, Jesus shows up. He is baptized too. And we still have to figure out a big question. If in baptism forgiveness is promised, if in baptism God brings us into his family, if all this stuff happens, if baptism is really important and significant, and it is, why was Jesus there? We know he's there because it doesn't make sense to our our human brains, why he would be there. He didn't need it, right? If everybody else was repenting and saying, I'm sorry, God, I have sinned against you. Um, I have fallen short. Um, And that's something you and I say in most of our worship services. God, I've sinned, I've fallen short. Good news, forgiveness comes through Jesus. Why is he here? Why did he make the trek from Jerusalem down the big hill from Jerusalem down to the Jordan River to travel back up once again Um, that's tough going uphill, up to Jerusalem. I've done it. I mean, I was out of shape when I did it, but this is a bit of a hike. 20 miles each way, that's a bit of a hike. Why is everybody there? Why is Jesus there? I think everybody's there because they realized, hey, I do need what this guy is proclaiming. I do need forgiveness. I do need to come clean to God. I do need to repent. But why is Jesus there? I think there's a couple things we can say. Number one, Jesus is showing up and he's legitimizing what John is doing. John is Jesus's cousin. If he never showed up at all, everybody would say, that John guy, he was kind of crazy, wasn't he? He was out in the desert. He ate locusts. He dressed in, you know, weird clothes and, you know, he ate honey and his diet was not well-rounded exactly. And You know, what what was that guy doing? Jesus showing up shows this is something important. And later, um, baptism would reach its fullness with what Jesus gave to his people. But the other part of it is Jesus came to be our substitute. He came to serve in our way, in every way. Jesus lived under the law circumcised on the eighth day, presented at the temple, lived in accordance with all of God's commands, and now here he is in the desert. Everybody around is saying, I am a sinner. Jesus is not, and yet he's standing in our place as though he were. And as he's washed and he's commissioned for his ministry, and the Holy Spirit descends upon him, and he goes out to complete the rest of his work. And he confronts sinners, and he confronts Satan himself and he stands firm and he goes to the end and he walks to the cross and he takes the rest of your sins upon him and he dies and he rises again. And in baptism, his death, his 
resurrection is yours. And it's all been accomplished for you. Because Jesus went to the river that day and everybody else was confessing their sins and he didn't need to be there, but for your sake he did. And for your sake he was washed and for your sake he lived and died and rose again. And so the question we had to figure out is baptized for what? Why were these people there? Why was Jesus there? What is baptism in the first place? What did any of these things accomplish or do? All of them are part of God's plan for your salvation. So that you might know, sinners can come to him, sinners can repent, sinners can admit their fault, and Jesus will wash them all clean. Because even for all the baptisms I've been a part of at St. James, I'm not saying they're illegitimate, but I'm saying God is at work in them much more than I am. Amen. Amen. Our worship continues as we use the Nicene Creed. You'll find that on pages 162 and 163 in the blue hymnal. Please stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with prayer. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence.
We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. Our worship continues on page 165. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lived among us as a human being and revealed his glory as your only Son, full of grace and truth, Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things, in him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross, and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated. We conclude our worship with our closing hymn. Once again, good morning, everyone. So nice to see all of you here. Oh, I know what you're doing. <laughs> I was going to put it in the bulletin, and I forgot. So this is perfect. This is perfect. Um, boy, that was a lot of snow, huh? Yeah, some of you uh, branches and trees down. I certainly saw it in my neighborhood, trees down. Um, Kind of all over the place. Some of you had power issues. Hopefully your power is back on and um, you're able to keep your house warm and keep everybody safe. Um, If you have a power outage still and need a place to go, the gathering place is very warm all of the time. We could set up an inflatable mattress. You guys could sleep there temporarily. Um, You know, if anything ever like that ever happens, just let me know. We do have some rooms in here. We could, you know, find a place for you to stay if you've got no family around or, um, you know, we want to be your family too. Just a couple things to announce. One of them is that choir. Megan would like the choir to stick around because she wants to run through some song. That's still happening. All right. Anybody who's in choir, please write immediately. Oh, you should turn the camera off. Okay, like five minutes from the time I walk out. Choir is supposed to practice something. Uh, Bible study will be happening today. The youth group, or the, the, the youth of St. James, were very kind in letting us borrow their room last Sunday. I requested permission that we borrow it one more time um, because we've been doing this study that has a a video component to it. It's looking at um, Jesus's ministry, but not just Jesus's ministry. It's Mary's perspective, you know, as she was the mother of Christ. Today is the last time we're going through that. If you'd like to join us, even if you missed the other ones, you're welcome to join us, but we'll be in the youth room and uh, we'll start around 10.30, although I, lost my, I left my phone at home, so we may or may not start on time, because I don't know what time it is right now. Um, other than that, Council of Elders is meeting. Handbells is starting up. Choir is continuing. 50 Plus is on Wednesday, Women's Morning Ministry, and the other things. There is the little handout in your bulletin. 
um, about the um, meditations or forward in Christ, a couple of publications that uh, if you don't have anything to use for devotional material, meditations um, is a great thing that you could get, and it's fairly inexpensive. So just check that out. Um, additionally, today is January 14th, which means this is your one-month reminder that Valentine's Day is coming. And Valentine's Day this year is extra special because it's also Ash Wednesday. Lent starts very early this year, uh, Wednesday, February 14th. And there are already plans for a, our Lenten midweek rotation with some of the pastors. We've got a new pastor coming this year, one who we haven't had before. Um, I won't tell you who it is. It'll just be a surprise. Won't that be fun? Won't that be fun? All right. It looks like uh, Mr. Corbin Schaefer has something to announce briefly. I will greet you at the door. Stick around. I'm sure this is going to be good. But God's blessings on the rest of your Sunday. Hello, everyone. As he said, my name is Corbin Schaefer, and this year I helped set up a fantasy football league for our church. We had 14 people from the congregation participate. Well, actually 15. There were 14 teams. 15 people participated, and now, since the football's regular season has come to an end and pl as playoffs are starting, we are now ready to hand out the golden football trophy to our winner. As I said before, thank you to everyone who participated. It was really fun. And yeah, I really enjoyed it. Hopefully we'll be able to do this again next year. And yeah, so now for our winners in third place, we have Henry Beagie. In second place, we have Caden and Noah Schaefer. And then in first place and taking home the golden football is Finn Beagie. Congratulations to everyone and thank you for participating. Have a great rest of your day.